Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ryan Leach and I am the social media and outreach associate at La Mama Experimental Theater Club. And we are so excited to be bringing you the second edition of La Mama's Live Talks today, which is going to be at every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can tune in for free on Facebook Live or on our website. And we're very excited to continue our conversations today during the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, by talking about the New York City Low Income Artist and Freelancer Relief Fund. And today I have brought on uh, two people, uh, Sean Escarciga and Nadia Tykolsker. Uh, they are heavily involved with this incredible fund that we're so excited to talk about with you. Uh, we're going to be talking for about 35 minutes today, and uh, Nadia will be leaving us at about 20 minutes in because she will be attending a Passover Seder. So uh, everybody's celebrating Passover today. We're happy to have you. Um, so we're going to talk about this New York City Low Income Artist and Freelancer Fund. Uh, the reason why the fund exists is because a lot of artists and freelancers uh, already sort of live in a precarious ecosystem of employment and art making. Uh, and this pandemic has led to a lot of obstacles for people involved in this a very important, very delicate ecosystem. Uh, I wanted to start out by having you two introduce yourselves and just very quickly sort of talk about how this fund began. Sure. Um, I'm Shauna Strasiga. Um, I'm an artist and an arts administrator based in Brooklyn. Um, I guess almost three weeks ago, I had lost some of my freelance work. Um, and this was prior to restaurants and museums and, and other institutions shutting down. Um, so I put out a few feelers on social media, checking in with people in my immediate community and friends, um, as this started to happen to them as well. And kind of put some feelers out for how everyone was doing and what, what they thought was going to happen and if we thought this was going to get worse. Um, and a friend of mine turned me on to the work being done in Seattle by um, Ijeoma Aluo on the Seattle Artist Relief Fund. Um, and at that point, it was they had raised about $70,000 on their GoFundMe. Um, and so that night, I kind of, on my own, I bit the bullet and used the model that they had set up. It was pretty simple and straightforward and um, to the point. And within the next day or so, Nadia came in and reached out to me and very graciously offered her support. Um, we know each other, of course, Nadia is on the board and I'm not the assistant director there um, and saved my life, <laughs> I think. I was like, Nadia, let's talk on the phone once, you know, a few thousand dollars comes in. And literally that hour, a few thousand dollars came in. And I was like, Nadia, I need to speak to you right now. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> inseparable since. Um, and I've kind of, I mean, it's, it's hard to believe it's been three weeks. Um, and we've started to partner with other organizations that we can talk about more in depth. But that's the Dance Union, Dance NYC, and the Indie Theater Fund. Um, to reach as many people as we can. Um, as of today, we've given out small gifts to about 455 people. Um, wow. And we'll be reopening our survey to, to apply uh, tomorrow. And Nadia? Yeah, I mean, Sean sort of gave you the origin story, which is majestic. Um, but Really, I'll just add, my name's Nadia, she, her pronouns. Uh, I'm an arts administrator, advocate, and um, also performance maker. And I was extremely impressed with the language that Sean had created initially um, for this fund. And that was part of why I reached out, because it became very clear very quickly that Sean and myself were both interested in creating something that could reach marginalized communities of artists and that that um that those folks were being centered and um you know we we talked to a bunch of people about this fund and we always like to say like it's actually not about sean and myself and what that although our relationship is probably one of the only good things that has happened to either of us during this pandemic <laughs> but like um but that the fund is about our community and about the people that we um, coexist 
swing in this community. And sort of the fund is also about the like systemic failures that are existing. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah. So could you both just talk a little bit more about sort of um, like you're trying, that's incredible that this was able to spread so quickly from Seattle to here, from Sean to Nadia, just through word of mouth. I feel like that's such a strength within our artistic communities. Um, hopefully more people will see it through this. But um, can you talk a little bit more about like, um, I know you're, I think that you're, uh, a lot of campaigns are raising money for these sort of communities. Could you sort of talk about what the communities that you're targeting look like, if people might not know, and also maybe talk about some of the obstacles that they've been facing during the pandemic that you've seen through the application process and sort of how the application process works really quickly. Sure. So we're prioritizing by POC, um, queer, non-binary, gender non-conforming, disabled, um, low-income artists and freelancers, anyone with urgent medical needs or urgent financial needs that are the result of the, the ramifications of the pandemic, whether that's closures um, or layoffs or whatever it is. Um, there's, there's a myriad of things that have happened that have led to people being in even more precarious situations than they were in prior to this. Um, the only stipulation we have when you're applying, um, and I say that in quotes because we're not an institution, we don't pretend to be one, we don't want to be one. Um, we want to have as few barriers for entry as possible. So if anyone self-identifies as being in need, um, the only stipulation is you live in New York and you provide us with uh, your payment information. We're paying via PayPal and Venmo. Um, and you leave us an email so that if you give us around PayPal or Venmo <laughs> information, we can contact you and, and get the correct information. Um, other than that, we're, we're happy to, to have you. Great. I think part of, part of what Sean just touched on that is really at the forefront of our conversations is that um, if you self-identify as having needs, like Sean and I are not quote unquote gatekeepers here. We just like put something up on GoFundMe and we're like, we need to get people money right now. And the federal government is not doing that. And neither are any of the institutions at the time that we started this, like none of the institutions were doing that yet. And I think just to like throw in another aspect of that, one of the things that we've seen in the growth of this fund is that um, actually a lot of the arts community is rising up to meet the challenge of this current situation. Um, not all, but <laughs> but a few, and we're in like cohortship with those folks at the moment. And Sean mentioned them: Dance NYC, the Dance Union, and the Indie Theater Fund. And we are we feel really fortunate that there's sort of this group of people that have come together to share resources. We talk about ethics. We talk about the actual mechanisms and logistics of running a fund and what that looks like. And then also like sharing resources around funders and sending funders and sharing resources around applicants. So, and to me, that's the most powerful aspect of our cohort at the moment is like, if you apply for a, our fund and you're a dancer, oh, could we maybe push you over to Dance NYC? Can we ensure that we're like giving out the information uh, between this cohort very selectively and in very small ways to then like reallocate money so that there are more resources for more people. Cool. And I know one of the organizations uh, you're working with, Culture Push, is your fiscal sponsor. Can you sort of talk a little bit more about what that kind of relationship means in this kind of fundraiser? Um, yeah. And this is something that, you know, up to up until we got to about $15,000 in the bank account, which was not that long. It didn't take that long. <laughs> um, all of that money was going into my bank account and I did not like that. Yeah. Um, well, um, <laughs> yeah. Scary. Um, it's very scary. And that so we very quickly <laughs> realized that we needed to have a fiscal sponsor um, for a number of reasons, but that being the most pressing reason. Um, and so I'm the assistant director of Culture Push, and that is on the board. Um, we spoke with Clarence DeMacchio, who's the executive director. Um, and since I would be the person administering the, the, the Culture Push end of things anyway, um, it was a very um, 
seamless relationship. Um, and Culture Push has been very, very giving in that sense, in that we're also fiscally sponsoring the dance union because um, they're also a GoFundMe campaign. So that's part of the relationship we have with the cohort um, is really trying to share the resources and the access that we have so that no one is worrying about these these like very practical issues that you don't really think about when there's an urgent need for, mm -hmm. for support. Um, and so Sean and I are like both administrators and artists. So we've been on the receiving end of institutional bullshit and the giving end of institutional bullshit. Um, and part of what I think is really interesting about the cohort is that there is a deep respect from institutions and grassroots organizers like Sean and myself and Melanie and Jay who run the dance union um, around like, listen, we can be um, talking to you about our ethics and thought processes and our ability to get funds out as quickly as possible. And like, if we can leverage some of the power that you may have in other ways, that would be really useful. And I think it's, it hasn't been something that I've experienced a lot in my professional life, to be totally frank. And it's been really beautiful to witness that type of cohortship and organizing actually happen in a moment like this. I love that. I love to hear that, that that's happening because I'm also an arts administrator. So I definitely have a sense about what you're talking about. Um, and I, you're both uh, arts advocates. And I know you've talked a little bit about how even before the pandemic, the situation for artists in New York, and I know from hearing other people talk that in Seattle, um, it was a little precarious to begin with, you know? Um, can you sort of talk about like what your, what your tasks were or your focuses were as arts advocates before the pandemic? Has that changed during the pandemic? Sure. I mean, a lot of my work as an artist is surviving, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like when you're an artist in New York, um, regardless of your discipline, um, it's a hustle. Um, I, I think that my work with Culture Push, the work that they support is, is at the center of activism and social justice and community engagement and artistic practice. Um, so I had a bit of a, I had a bit of an insight into work like that that was going on in the city. Um, and I think that really helped shape the perspective that, it, that both of us were coming to with, with this work. Um, the realization that no one is just an artist in New York, um, mm -hmm. that for, unless you have a trust fund, but even then, like, that can still be precarious, but let's not go there yet. Um, but for most people who don't have trust funds, you're working in a restaurant or you're working as an administrator or you're working in a restaurant and as an administrator and doing any number of things to sustain your artistic practice that that you are living month to month. And this, uh, this idea, it's often romanticized of being a starving artist in New York or being a New York artist, that it's tough, that that it's hard here, it is. And um, especially when you're a, a marginalized person to begin with, and then an artist, um, or in addition to being an artist, um, the access to resources as dense of a cultural hotspot as New York is are not, they're not accessible to everyone. And they're not accessible to, to all disciplines and they're not accessible to all walks of life. And I think that is something that is really coming out in our applications for the fund and in our conversations around the fund and in the blind spots that we, we've come up against when we're talking to, to larger organizations about where funding is going and how their processes work and how quickly we're seeing funds like ours and the, and the dance union um, and, and dance Embassy and the indie theater fund um, as well, but more for the grassroots organizations and, and groups, how quickly we can just kind of do things. And that's, I think what it means to be an artist in New York is that you know that you're living precariously, so you have to make things work and you have to make things work quickly. Um, and I think that's coming to light even more than it was before all of this happened. Yeah, and I think just to add on, 
to all that. Before this, I was doing a lot of like individual, like producing, advocating work for artists of color, particularly, specifically black artists, and um, and leading that work with an anti-racist lens. And so, you know, one of the things that we're seeing about this pandemic is that marginalized people and like the racist systems in our country are like continuing to reveal themselves as such, right? So like mm -hmm. people affected by it are those folks as Sean mentioned and you know like the systems that are failing us now have always failed us like there's no universal health care there's no rent stabilization there's no rent freezes at the moment like all of those systems healthcare, welfare medicare access to food access to transportation access to housing security like those are still the issues, not even to mention, like, we can't even start talking about the prison system, et cetera, et cetera. And, like, I think I mentioned this a little bit yesterday when we were talking or we got to this at a certain point in our conversation. But, like, as Sean was mentioning, no artists are just siloed as artists. That's not a thing. Like, that's not, like, that is a fallacy and a fantasy. And I just refuse to have a conversation in which there isn't the acknowledgement that every single artist is also a myriad of other things as well. And so all of those larger systems are what we need to be talking about when we're talking about security in the arts, right? And like what that means, like what does it mean that artists, freelance artists in experimental communities aren't unionized, you mm -hmm. know, like what does that look like? That's part of why we had to start this fund. Like the fund is the symptom of like all of the problematic systems, you know, yeah. or an attempted band-aid for all of the problematic systems. It is like certainly not a solution. Within an industry that brings like billions of dollars to the city of New York every single year. Yeah, so, definitely. Totally. Um, that was one thing I wanted to uh, touch on going forward. Um, these are people who have an incredible number of skills. They're very versatile. They're very flexible. They're used to working multiple different jobs, doing different things. Um, on your fundraising site, it talks about resources for finding work. What are ways that people who have the means to employ others can help? Oh, the sound didn't work? Oh, no. One second. Can you hear now? Yes, it works? Yeah. Oh, thank goodness, yeah. my God, okay. So what I was saying before I was silenced was that uh, these are a bunch of people with a lot of skills. They're versatile, they're flexible, they can do a lot of things. And on your fundraising site, it says that people can help employ them, not just donate money to the fund. Can you talk more about that? Sure. Do you wanna, Nadia, since you're about to leave? Oh, yeah, yeah, I have like two minutes. Uh, well, Sean, you can speak to the specifics of the resources that are on our site, but there have been a lot of amazing resources and platforms that come up that have come up during this time. You know, a lot of artists who are like at home being like, I can do classes on Instagram Live, X, Y, and Z. And like, I think something that we're pointing to that is maybe even a more sustainable solution than a GoFundMe fund is like artists like to make up and like to make work and if you pay them for their work then they will be paid <laughs> as simple as that <laughs> but sean can tell you more about the specifics that are on our site i think um i probably can't do i'm just gonna mess it up so i don't want to of course. <laughs> that's one of the biggest things that we're trying to post we're trying to use the campaign page as a resource page as well when we when we can't help someone immediately or when the surveys paused um, or any number of reasons. Um, so we've linked um, to all of our systems. Um, all of that information is there. The Actors Fund is there. Um, Artistsrelief.org is there, which is a new site that was just launched today, which is a coalition of larger institutions in New York. Um, there's a website called Hire Artists, where artists can list services um, for free. And it's kind of like a, a text list kind of dating website for jobs where you can post like, I'm offering Spanish lessons for $40 an hour. Um, wow. Just to help bolster, it's one thing to give immediate relief and it's another to start bolstering the systems that produce this. Yeah. Um, and so trying to rethink the economy that 
existed before this and use this as an opportunity within the context of where we are now to shift that a little bit, I think is really important. Um, and like Nadia said, yeah, artists should be paid for their work. Artists should be, artists should not have to worry about a theater closing down or losing a, a gig that they shouldn't have to worry about not being able to pay the rent or buy their medication or eat because um, they've chosen to be artists. That's absolutely ridiculous. And I, oh, you're gonna go. Thank you so much for joining us, Nadia. Enjoy your Passover Thanks. Seder. Thanks. Thank also, you. Also, to throw out into the universe, Sean and I are very accessible. Email us, talk to us. We want to hear from you. Um, if there are things that we said that you liked, if there are things that we said that you didn't like, I want to hear both of those things. <laughs> um, but please be well and safe and healthy and talk to you in the future. Amazing. Thank you, Nadia. Talk soon. Thank you. Bye. And then Sean and I will keep speaking. Uh, I wanted to say real quick, we do have a couple of comments with questions. Um, and I want to open up to anyone who's watching right now. Sean and I are going to be talking for another like 10 minutes. And if you have anything that you want to ask him or ask me um, or just ask to the world, uh, please feel free to respond in the comments on Facebook Live. Um, we have one right here, Sean, which is, uh, will this fund continue even after this situation is resolved? Which I think is an interesting question because um, people have been talking about, um, you know, when does the pandemic end? Like, when does New York open again? So like, when will this, if these problems existed before the fund and they exist during the fund, like, when will the fund ever end? Um, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I honestly don't know. <laughs> It's been three weeks and Good so answer. much has happened in three weeks and things continue to happen. And I think we're seeing the aftermath of the immediate crisis and the immediate loss of income and jobs. I think there's going to be another wave once quarantine is over and once things start to reopen that we'll have to play it by ear. Um, I know that we're like we're talking to Dance NYC right now, they're able to fund through June. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, I, I, we would like to be able to fund through June. Um, and as we've been getting larger donations in and more funders in, we have the capacity right now to do two payments in April. Um, and we should be okay to do at least one in May. Um, I, like Nadia said, this isn't about us, so we're trying to listen to the needs of, of what is happening and the people who are reaching out to us. So if the need is still there and people are still giving us money, we will still administer like those funds and we'll still run this campaign and then adapt it and grow it as we need to to the needs of what's going on. But we're also two artists in the middle of this. We, we don't know. Amazing. Um, um, I know also... Um uh, what was I going to say? Dance NYC has like a survey that you can fill out on their website. Uh, I know they've shared it on social media too. And it's a way to tell these institutions as individual artists in the city, what this looks like, like paint a picture for them. How has this pandemic affected you? And that's going to be a way for them to um, give a presentation to the city and to the funders during and after the pandemic in order to make sure that resources are being properly distributed, which is a free, easy, fast way. I definitely filled it out. I sent it to a bunch of my dance friends. Um, and I know that um, Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS recently donated to you, which how will that uh, affect the fund going forward? Um, massively. Um, we were saying that for every $10,000 on this first round, we gave up to hundred. dollars um, and so we were saying that we could give six to 66 new people for every $10,000 that we raised. Um, and Equity Fights AIDS, um, Broadway Cares gave us $20,000. Um, on top of a few other, the Gilman Foundation, or Gilman Foundation gave us $10,000. Um, actually, they gave us $25,000 on Fights AIDS. Wow. Um, Howard um, Gilman also donated, you said? $10,000, yeah. Wow. Um, so we're seeing a lot of foundations shift their their policies a bit to meet wow. what has happened, and it's incredibly refreshing to for that. And so we're very grateful for that. Um, so that shifting our fund, we're able to we're going to open the fund up to a hundred new people, and we're going to raise the funding gift to two hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so that is really exciting. We'll be opening our survey tomorrow at 11 a.m. We'll post the survey onto our campaign page. Um, and then 100 people can apply for that. Wow. And they can just go on GoFundMe and it'll all be available there, correct? Yeah. I'll, I'll put it in a, in a front and center. <laughs> Great. We'll try to share it too as well. That would be incredible. Um, one last thing you I uh, mentioned on your GoFundMe page, ethical cancellations. What is that? And like, is, is that a way that institutions can help with this process? Um, ethical cancellations, what do you, in what context? Oh, I think it was just like a link, but um, it was talking about like, I think the way that artists, when events and things get canceled, can sort of like move forward. I know like one way. Oh, a public letter. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a, that's a public letter that can be signed. Um, cool. So you're trying to put pressure on institutions to have better systems in place, aside from just firing people. Um, we're not paying them. Um, so setting in language and contracts that um, will protect artists more more fully. Um, and all the information is on that link. Great. Um, so wrapping up, do you have any last minute comments, Sean? It's been so wonderful to talk to you and Nadia both. I've definitely learned a ton. Um, yeah, but yeah. Having us. Um, I will say, please, the way that this fund has been able to sustain Oh, wait, one second. The audio. We're, we're, we have limited capacity in terms of our knowledge. Um, so if anything that we've said is in someone's, um, someone's skill set, set to help us with, whether that's shifting policy or or connecting us to other foundations or connecting us with artists who need this, this fund, um, please stay connected. That's how this works. Okay, incredible. Thank you so much. So we'll go ahead and sign off. You can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Oh my God. Uh, little technical glitches, but I think we got most of the good information out and I'm so excited. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. We're so happy uh, that you tuned in and we'll be here next week with a whole nother conversation. Uh, and thank you to all of La Mama's funders that make these possible, these like live streams possible. And we'll talk more soon. Thanks, Sean. Bye. Bye.